One of the first steps of understanding macroeconomics is understanding how we measure a nation's or a region's or a large sector of an economy, and we call that gross domestic product. So this lecture is going to introduce you to that and work you through it. So let's get started. So what is GDP? Well, GDP is gross domestic product. Basically, it's the income of the nation. And we know that the higher the income, generally the higher the standard of living. If you think about the people in the United States who make more money have a higher standard of living than people who do not make much money. And this little chart you're looking at here, well, basically we're doing the same thing. We're looking at the total income of a nation when we look at GDP, and it gives us a way to help us track and chart and see how countries are doing. Now, there's a couple of interesting things to look at on this one. You probably have already noticed that China jumps from basically being number 10 to being number two by 2011. But also notice on the side that when we start talking about and this is trillions, it's six versus 15 trillion. So basically the income levels have more than doubled within those 10 years. And Canada and Spain, they're not even in the top 10 anymore. So there've been some changes and shuffling and things like that occur. This helps us understand what's going on and gives us a comparison, basically a marker on, on how we're doing. So let's take a little bit more look at GDP. It's going to be a little simplified here at first because I really want you to understand what GDP is before we really start breaking it down. So it basically is there to measure two things. The first one is the total income and the total expenditures of goods and services. Now, the total income in an economy is basically all the money being paid to people and the expenditures are everything we're spending as people. Now, what's interesting is that for an economy as whole, the income must equal the expenditures. Basically, what comes in goes out. So how does that sort of play out? Well, here we got good old Larry. Larry runs a car wash. And we have Michael here, who's you know an employee. He's leaving his house to go get his car, who's been car washed by Larry. Now, the seller and the buyer have both agreed on $50 for this expenditure. And the seller is going to get 50, the buyer is going to get 50. So the income is going to equal the expenses. And that's how basically GDP can be used when we start talking about the fact that it measures basically the same thing. Now, another way to look at this is going back to that circular flow diagram we talked about quite a while back ago. So what we first have is Michael, who is a household. And when we look at Michael, Michael is going to basically be spending some of his money and he's going to go to the market. He's going to get these goods and services and that's going to equal revenue. Now, in this case, we are saying Michael is spending everything and this is a pretend economy, but it's a good way for us to kind of get us in our head before we really start breaking this down. Now, if he spends all of his money, this all goes into the firm. The firm is going to pay out wages, expenses. It's going to have some profits, which is going to become income for Michael which is GDP. So the same flow of money is going to go around and around. Well, we can have an opposite flow and there's Larry. Larry is basically representing the firm. And so he's going to be spending money for goods and services, which are going to go to the marketplace. And we're going to have the goods and services that are bought by the marketplace. He's going to exchange that for land, labor, and capital. Because remember, he's going to be basically working for somebody and those are going to go into the factors of production. Now in a simple GDP, basically the spending and the revenue are going to be the same. That assumes that Michael spends all of his money and Larry spends all the money that he makes in there. Now we know that's not exactly true and we're going to kind of break this down a little bit more, but that's basically why we say that revenue and spending are going to be the same, that the income equals the expenditures when it comes to GDP. So let's start breaking GDP down just a little bit more. Now that you have a kind of general understanding of what GDP is, let's get to a more precise definition. And that's GDP is the market value of all final goods and services produced within a country in a given period of time that you just read. There's a couple aspects of this, though, that we need to go through to make sure you understand exactly what it's talking about. Basically, that we're on the same page. 
You might wonder, you know, what is market value? Well, market value is determined by market price. And what we're talking about here is how much are individuals willing to pay for items? And so when we talk about paying for items, we're talking about is this basically this comprehensive basket of items. And you quite often hear that, the basket of items. I mean, we talk about you can't compare apples to oranges. Well, in GDP, we do. We have apples and oranges and rent and all kinds of things, but we don't include illegal goods. We also don't produce goods that aren't being produced within the economy. So if you're married and Larry mows your grass for you, he's not getting paid to do that. So even though that is a production and it has value, it doesn't have value within the economy because money is basically not being exchanged for it. No product is being exchanged for this. So GDP is very comprehensive, but what that also is going to allow us to understand is just how valuable one item is to an economy versus another. So let's say we are measuring apples and oranges and people are willing to pay twice the cost for an orange than they are for an apple. So we would say that that oranges basically double their value to the economy than apples do. But we have to find out what all these items cost by using the market price that are available. So that means that GDP is going to fluctuate because we know the market price for items are going to fluctuate. Now, sometimes people ask me about rent and home ownership. Well, rent is pretty easy. We can figure out rent because when somebody pays rent, that's recorded as, you know, out for one person, but it's income to the landlord and the landlord has to report that rent money. And so we're able to do that. So what about if I own a home? Well, what they can do, and, and again, we're not going to get that sophisticated. There is a process in which they can calculate basically what the value of the home would rent for. And then they calculate the value of that house based on the rent that could be produced, which is sort of what the mortgage would be. Now, final goods is kind of um, one that you need to make sure you understand, and that's the word final. Uh, when we talk about a final good, we're talking about the actual product that's sold to the public, the end product, some of you might call. So the classic example is basically paper. Um, paper is produced, I mean, trees are cut down, paper is produced, paper is sold to many different people. Um, let's say to a greeting card company, the greeting card company uses that paper, it produces a greeting card and then sells the greeting card to the public. It is the greeting card that's sold to the public that is counted. The other goods are considered intermediate goods. So the wood pulp is an intermediate good. When it's produced into paper, that's an intermediate good because all of those costs keep getting rolled into the next version of the good. So when the tree was cut down, the cost of cutting down the tree and making the wood fiber was already rolled into the cost of the paper. The cost of the paper was rolled into the cost of the card. So it is the final good not intermediate goods that are counted in GDP. Also, we do talk always about tangible and intangible. Tangible, those items you can touch and feel, intangible. We tend to talk about those as being services. So like a haircut is an intangible good. I can't really walk around. I mean, you can see my haircut, but I can't walk around with the actual haircut in my hand. It's not something I can carry, you might want to say. Also, only newly produced goods are counted. So if I sell a used car, that won't count. It's when that car was originally produced, it counted. So reselling of used goods, not part of it, only when it's actually produced. Now, this is one that sometimes people get a little bit wrong, is that it's only what counts inside the borders of that country which means that if you're an American company and you're producing a car, let's say in Japan, you've got a Japanese factory, that Japanese factory does not count toward US economy because the money and everything is in Japan. So it would count for the Japanese economy, but not the American economy. The same way that if um, a Korean car company opens up a factory in the United States, let's say Louisiana, everything that's produced in that Louisiana factory is part of the US GDP. Same with workers, by the way. Sometimes people forget that if we have a worker, a legal worker now, somebody who's on a work visa who comes in, an engineer, let's say, and from Canada who comes to work uh, for NASA, their income is actually part of the United States GDP, not part of the Canadian GDP. The same way that if an actor comes from the United States and goes to 
uh, Bollywood, India, and stars in a movie there, their compensation, all of that, it is going toward India's GDP. So it's what actually is produced within the borders generally when we talk about a country. Also, it's always about a time range. Now, the most common time ranges are years and quarters. Um, there's four quarters in a year, so the government always releases every quarter of the GDPs. Now, one of the things that's kind of interesting is something called the seasonally adjustment. Now, BEA is the Bureau of Economics um, Accountability in the government, and I thought that they had sort of the best writing, you might want to say, of what seasonal adjustment is. It's going to be really hard for us to compare what's happening in the last quarter of the year with the first quarter of the year. If we're talking about something like retail, when you know that the Christmas holiday shopping period is going to see generally a natural increase in shopping. So there is a very sophisticated statistical analysis that's been done because we've got years and years and years and years, centuries of data, and we seasonally adjust GDP so that we can compare one season to another season season. Now there are some things like weather that we know can play into things, but then there are also unusual things. And so we can look at that unusual see and see how much of a change or how much of effect did that really have on GDP. So this is a little bit more of a precise, you might say, definition of GDP. So next let's break down how we actually calculate and what goes into the calculation of GDP. While there are several different approaches of how to calculate GDP for a nation, the expenditure approach is probably the most common that we hear when you hear people talking about GDP, let's say on TV. So you'll see the two formulas. Let's go through them step by step. They're basically the same formula. The C stands for consumption. Basically everything that a household may buy is considered to be consumption. Whether you're buying a hard good like an automobile or you're buying food or you're buying a service like haircuts, these are all consumption. And they literally put together a basket of goods, you might want to say, and each quarter they measure that basket of goods and see how that's working out. And then they can make an estimate on the consumption part. To that, they add in investment. Now, we got to be careful here because when I tend to hear the word investment, I tend to think financial investments. That's not exactly what we're talking about here. We're talking about items that may be purchased to upgrade or make better or produce more. So for our our guy Larry here who's running the car wash, if he buys a new car wash or he buys equipment, or he buys um, a new location even, that we would call business capital. Now, buying a new house, we call residential capital. Now, you wonder why is that under consumption? Well, because you're not really consuming a house. You buy a house, you use it, and the expectation is that you'll sell that house later, hopefully for a larger amount of money, and thus you have put in capital. And inventories is one that we don't tend to think about as the everyday person, but how do we account for when something is produced but not sold right away? So let's say that Ford Motor Company makes a whole bunch of cars and they haven't shipped them all. It's the end of the quarter. Well, what the government does, and again, we're not accountant majors, we assume that Ford Motor Company has sort of bought the cars because they own the cars. So that inventory would be counted as an investment because they're investing in those products to hopefully sell them later. Now, the G is for government purchases, and government purchases include federal, state, and local governments. They are the largest purchaser in the United States, and in almost all governments, the government purchases are the largest purchases um, buyer, you might say, in the nation. Now, that would include things like your military, um, your firefighters, maybe locally or, or statewide, your doctors and nurses for the VA clinic, but it also includes the buildings that they may have to work in. It includes putting in new roads and highways. It includes um, the airline traffic controllers. It's an enormous amount of items that come underneath government purchases. Now, I do want to make sure you understand that Social Security is not considered a purchase because we're not buying anything with Social Security or Medicare or Medicare. Medicaid. Those are not purchases. Those are what we call transfer payments. We'll talk about those later, but we're not really buying anything. We're not paying a service for that. And then last, we have net exports. So 
NX is for net export, but I quite often also see X minus M, which just basically means exports minus imports, because what net exports is, is the difference between your exports and your imports. So we might produce a lot of eggs and we export them, but we're going to import perhaps rice from Asia that produces that. Now, what's interesting is that compared to the other numbers, this number can both be positive or a negative number. And we quite often talk about our um, imports being greater than our exports or is our exports greater than our imports. Now, remember earlier I said it all depends on where things are made. So if Boeing is making airplanes in Asia, those will not count as an export because they're being actually produced there. But if they produce them in the United States and then they sell them to Asia, that would be considered an export. So these are sort of the parts that go into GDP when we talk about the um, expenditure approach. And again, as I said, there are a couple other different approaches, but let's get to more important aspects. We want to use GDP to help us make decisions. I mean, that's one of the reasons we do any of the statistical analysis. But in order for us to make decisions about the economy, we need to know if the GDP is going up because we are producing more goods or because the goods are basically costing us more. Because remember, there are multiple sections to that GDP price. That means that we really need two different ways to look at GDP. We need what we call nominal and real GDP. So let's take a look at those and see what really sort of the difference is. Now, they're both looking at the total economy of outputs and production within a given year. But where the big difference is, is the price. Nominal is going to use today prices. And they're going to say, here's what the price is today. Here's how much that apple is. Whereas real GDP is going to pick what we call a base year. So it's going to say, well, based on the year 2000 prices, how much is that apple today? Now, this becomes very helpful because if we can see how much that apple in 2000 was and we use the same inflationary prices of 2000 for today, we could see how much that apple, if I was able to transport it in time back to 2000, you know, how much of a difference is there really? And maybe the actual cost of the apple went up 10 cents. Well, then we know it's not that we're producing more. It might be because things are costing more money. So it's based on, you know, the current price versus the base year price. Also, we need to understand about inflation. Now, nominal GDP doesn't take inflation into account. Why? Because current market price already has inflation built in. Whereas real GDP does take inflation in, into account because that's why we use a base market price. We go back to the year 2000. And so any inflation from 2000 until today would not be counted in the price of the product. But you remember, see, in nominal, since we're using today's prices, all that inflation would be in there. We also find that the value for GDP um, basically using nominal tends to be much higher because we're taking today's market prices into consideration. Whereas if we're using at historical prices, they're always going to be a little bit lower. We also will say that when you're talking about GDP and you hear people talk about GDP, real GDP quite often is the one that they're talking about. Now, it doesn't mean that they don't talk about nominal GDP. Really, it's more about what time frame they're using. Because while nominal GDP is really easy to compute, so if we're talking about something in the short term, I could pull out my numbers and compute that really quickly. When we're talking about real GDP, it's a little bit more complex. Now, there are professional groups of people who do this. Remember, we have economists in the government and companies have economists for them. So you don't have to worry about computing it yourself, but it is a little bit more complex to compute because we have to take inflation and other things into consideration. So we're probably going to see nominal GDP used more when they're talking about something within this last year. So last quarter or this spring, they're talking about something very close. Because again, if we're talking about a close time frame, then current market prices aren't going to shift that dramatically. But if we're talking about years, if we're talking about 2000 versus today, we're talking about years of shifting prices. And so we're probably going to be using real GDP more often. Now, what's interesting is that when I listen to people and they're talking about these two items, I don't hear them say the word nominal. 
very often when they're talking about you know something within the year so you just hear them refer to that as GDP but I will hear them talk about real GDP when they tend to be talking about a period of time so that might be one way for you when you're listening to the talking heads on TV or you're reading the newspaper you will tend to see that they'll use the word real when they are talking about real GDP and they may not use the word nominal they may simply use the word GDP when they're talking about that now both of them we want to use to understand what's going on but because there's a shift in price nominal GDP is really hard to talk about economic growth because economic growth isn't usually measured in short time periods when we start talking about economic growth we are talking about longer time periods more than a year generally two years three years five years economic growth is a long-term goal situation and so it's much easier using real GDP to look at long term than it is with nominal but nominal is very good for us understanding what's happening right now today in the short term so let's take a look at a real chart and we can see sort of how nominal versus real GDP shows up now one of the important things here is notice it says 2000 equals 100 what they're really trying to tell us here is that the year 2000 and you'll notice it right here that is where they're basing their real GDP from meaning is is that we just talked about that real GDP is going to use a price from a specific time period so their base prices are coming from 2000 and so after 2000 you can see that gross GDP is higher as we said it tends to look higher whereas the real GDP is down here so if we were using 2000 prices the prices from 2000 we would see that the GDP in this time frame let's see if I can make my arrow go straight across is about hundred and forty um, and by the way this is trillion whereas if we're using gross GP it's 200 so the difference between these two which is about 60 is basically the difference in 2000 prices versus the current price level so it's a good example of why we might use each one because if we were trying to use current price levels to understand how things have shifted it may not give us as much of a realistic concept as using real GDP but let's look at a couple other ways that this applies to us in the real world here's a real chart from the Bureau of Economic Analysis which is part of the US Department of Commerce and if you have an opportunity get onto that website you're gonna see lots of good data now probably what caught your attention are those two big old orange boxes that are dramatically going up and down yeah that was called a pandemic um, now one thing to really look at we're saying real GDP which means is that they're basing this on some sort of a set year and what we're looking at is sort of a comparison now notice we're doing these by quarters and we're looking at the percentage of change over here and notice that our percentage of change yeah, doesn't have huge dramatic changes up until basically 2020 and then in 2020 we see this dramatic downturn in GDP pandemic and then we see basically what looks like this really big recovery and then this little recovery over here well they'll put charts out like this all the time but they also put out explanations of those charts so it's always important to read those explanations in this case what they're talking about is from quarter to quarter so if in 2040 let's say there's an economic student looking at this information they're probably not going to see this quarterly stuff instead this will be all added together into a yearly output like we just saw in the last chart so one of the things that we do notice is that this Bureau of Economic Analysis is really the sort of experts you might want to say about the US economy and that's where most people go to get their information but it's also important always to look at real GDP versus nominal GDP and to look for that word if this had been nominal GDP we would see a very different chart with very different numbers but because we're using real GDP and we're using a base year we can really compare what's happened one year to the next year because of that base price
GDP deflator, which is also called GDP price deflator, implicit price deflator, all the same thing again. Basically, what we're looking at is a measure, a change of prices, not in the quantity that are selling, in the change in price of goods or services across a period of time. Now, what this is measuring is basically inflation for us. What's really important is that we're talking about real GDP, which means we have to have a base unit that we're using. So a base unit is generally a year, remember. What year are we starting with? So let's take a look at this chart. And in this case, what we're looking at basically is a base year of 2012. So what, and by the way, this comes from the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. I like this little um, graphing chart of theirs. It copies really well. Um, what this is basically saying is, is if we use 2012 prices, and that's our base. How much are things costing now? Well, notice I picked this one point right here because when we looked at the first quarter of 2017, notice the price is 107.01. Well, we can sort of drop the 100 because we know that's where we started. Basically, what it's saying is that between this point and this point, there was a 7% rise in prices. So inflation was 7%. We can also see over here in quarter four of 2020, so the end of 2020, compared to 2012, prices had gone up about a little, a little over 14%. So my bread or something that may have cost a dollar back in 2012 is now costing probably about a dollar and 14 cents. Now, that's an about because different products are going to have slightly different inflations. This is an average inflation price. But what it does show us is that we've had a pretty steady increase except for right there. And as we know, we had this pandemic that comes along in the second quarters of 2020. So we see a slight price drop, but it goes right back up. So we see that inflation continues. Now, inflation from year to year can also be measured because if I go back and I look at what is the inflation here, and the change between here and here may tell me that it only went by 1%. But we can see it's a pretty steady rise and then it kind of dips a little bit and it goes up. Now, one of the important things here is that you don't notice any kind of tan areas like you notice over here. Generally, in a lot of charting that you see, including the St. Louis charts. When you see a gray area, now this is not gray, but a gray area, that would actually represent a recession period. And I'll show you a chart of that before we finish with this lecture. Because there is no gray, there was no recession in this time period. We only had inflation. Recession is where prices go down. Inflation is where prices go up. So we want this price deflator because it helps us understand how much prices have gone up. Now, the big question is, is what is your base year? So we could make a base year of 2000 and look at the price change from 2000 till, till whatever time. But in this case, they use 2012. There's usually a kind of a standard generally people are using. Now, why would I want to know inflation? Well, a lot of times, at least in business, our contracts may be based on a certain price, but there's an inflationary period to it, meaning is that if the inflation goes up by a certain X amount of money, the costs are going to change. My costs may go up. I have to look at whether or not I'm going to rise, raise other prices. So landlords who are renting things and they're looking at inflation, they may need to raise their rent because they're going to have to pay more taxes and it's going to cost them more to maintain something businesses are going to want to look at inflation because as inflation goes up, people are going to want more money in their paychecks to be able to pay for the goods and services that they get right now. Because back in 2012, remember, your your bread may have cost, and bread was more than a dollar, but a candy bar was a dollar, let's say. But now over here in 2020, that candy bar is a dollar 14. So I need 14 more cents than I had before to buy the same thing. So you'll see the deflators all over the place. And what deflators really tell us is basically what the real GDP is compared to the nominal GDP. It helps us measure that inflation. Let's look at one last GDP chart. And this one is looking at a much longer time period. You might have noticed it goes from 1950 up to basically the last quarter of 2020 couple of things to notice in here is that we are talking about $2012. Um, 
And it does say that this is the observation through the fourth quarter of 2020. Now, you'll notice if you've read this that basically from 1965 to today, we've been averaging about a 3% increase. But that doesn't mean that we are a steady 3% increase. In fact, every one of these little gray areas shows a recession. And over here is the Great Recession of 2008. You can see that's a pretty dramatic drop down compared to some of these other recessions. In fact, you might look at a recession like this one and say there's hardly any drop at all, or this one looks pretty straight. And that's because a recession isn't always based on a deflation of prices. It could also include things like unemployment. It could include other items that help us decide whether it's a recession. And that's why this area down here is kind of yellow because it hasn't been decided whether or not there really is a recession yet. A recession does require certain statistical things and we're not quite seeing a recession because we are seeing that we had a huge decrease but we're bouncing back pretty fast. And as we showed in some other slides, you know, this may be a blip more than an actual recession for that 2020 time period. But what it does show is that from 1965, basically from here until, let's say, uh, 2018, we pretty much have been averaging about a 3% increase in GDP, which is more than actually our population growth was each year. And if we have more productivity than we have people, that means that basically on average, on average, each American is making more money than the generation before that their, their productivity is higher. Now we know and on average means that there are gonna be some people who make more and some people that make less. So it doesn't mean that you may be more prosperous than your parents were, but the average American is more prosperous than their parents. And we can think about things like how many people own cars, how many people own houses, how many people have cell phones now. You know, it's, it's amazing to stop and think about the amount of items that we own now and we think of as a absolute have to have that basically the generations before didn't have. So this is kind of a nice look at sort of an overview of all of GDP for a very long time. But we do need to talk about the fact that there are, you know, other measures of income that can be used. Let's take a quick look at those. We're going to quickly look at the four other kind of common measures of income that you hear out there. Now, GNP, not GDP. The biggest difference here is that in GDP, we didn't count anything that happened outside the market that we were measuring. So I'm going to use the U.S. as our example. If I had somebody working in Japan, their income wasn't counted in GDP, but we would count the Canadian who was working in Texas into our GDP. Well, in GNP, it would be the opposite. We wouldn't count the Canadian because they weren't an American nationalist, but we would count the American nationalist who was working in Japan. So basically, it's just focusing on what people of that nation or that market region might be doing. So, you know, people from Florida who are working in other states. With net national product and MP, basically what we know is that a lot of capital equipment will lose value due to wear and tear. So we have to think more about businesses perhaps in this location. So we think about Larry who has that car wash business. You know, part of the thing is, is that right now we look at the value of his business, but at the same point, he's lost value through wear and tear. Uh, Michael, if he buys a car, he's gonna lose some value in that car. We always joke you lose $2,000 the moment you drive a new car off the showroom floor. So Net National Product tries to basically get an idea of what we have as far as income is concerned minus what we call depreciation. Then we have personal income and personal income is going to add in basically those payments we talked about that we weren't going to include before things like social security and other government benefits like unemployment because in the past we didn't include those in GDP because those weren't really based on production but with personal income that would be included but it also excludes money that companies have made but don't go outside the company. So all companies retain some of their earnings. They have to keep some inside the company so that they can do things in the future. 
they can't be basically have zero bank accounts you might want to say so these retained earnings they don't leave the company they don't go out into the marketplace so with personal income we take away return earning uh, retained earnings that are part of GDP but we add in things like Social Security and other government benefits because you're getting those things out into the into the public their personal income whereas disposable personal income is basically what we just said personal income but we subtract everything that you have to pay as far as government is concerned so after you pay your taxes and any other government bills you may have then how much money do you have left over so if you may have uh, a salary of let's say fifty thousand dollars but after you pay your taxes which can be remember federal state local and any other government bills you might have how much money do you really have left to spend inside the economy so these are the four sort of other measures of of income that will use and talk about throughout um, these different lectures some of these will go into a little bit more detail when we get into certain chapters on these subjects this is a question that is often asked you know why do we care about GDP and there are always arguments that GDP is not such a good measure of economics probably the most famous is an argument made by Robert Kennedy who argues that basically GDP doesn't allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education, or the joy of play. It doesn't include the beauty of poetry or the strength of marriages or intelligence of our public debate or the integrity of our public officials. It measures neither our wit nor our courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to our country. It measures everything in short except that which makes life worthwhile and he isn't completely incorrect so why do we care about GDP well the truth is is that countries that have stronger GP GDPs have the ability to pay for health care for their children have the ability to create educational systems for our children who then can learn poetry who can then help strengthen the country who can then have intellectual public debates basically in short GDP may not directly measure those things that make life worthy but it does measure our ability to obtain many of the inputs that allow the worthiness of our lives now there are countries that do look at this differently Bhutan as a great example has a measurement of national happiness and they feel national happiness is more important than national gross product so it is an argument more of a philosophy argument but the question is is how do we determine if things are able to be there because if we look at countries that have lower GDP versus countries that have higher GDP we do find the health of those children different especially in education if we have a stronger GDP country those children can be taken out of the factories they can be taken out of the fields they can be taken out and educated we can take them out of the economy because we don't need them to add to the economy we don't need their labor in order to produce so we have the ability to spend time to educate in lower GDP countries children work the fields they work in the factories they're needed to help produce and so we use GDP to help us and look at those measurements so that we can obtain these things but at the same point we're not going to say that Robert Kennedy is completely wrong because GDP isn't going to tell us about the strength of our marriages but it is a measure to help us know if we're basically helping our society have the inputs to gain these items I hope you found this lecture helpful and there are many more topics available over at the economics playlist for you to successfully get through your economics courses till next time keep learning